On behalf of our President and Executive Director, J.C. Maitalanik, JCCH Board of Directors, members, donors, and staff, welcome to the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii's Talk Story Session, The Early Life of Our Mo'ili'ili, with artist and editor Laura Ruby. How many of you are members of the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii? Can I see a raise of hands? Hey, great. <laughs> okay, we want to thank you very much for your generous support to JCCH. You know, your um, support makes programs like this possible. So, if any of you who are not members would like to become members, we welcome you to join us uh, in our JCCH family. You can receive 10% discount in our gift shop. And that starts today if you sign up today. And you can do that at the gift shop downstairs. Um, and there's also going to be a discount on Moe Eating the Life of the Community, which is also available in the gift shop. And today, if you become a member, we have a special membership. This is our legacy of the Japanese and Hawaii cuisine. And so if you become a member today, or if you renew your membership today, then this will be our complimentary gift to you. It's an event special. Okay, so for that, you can see Marla Music, who is our Director of Development and Communications, and she'll be at the table outside, as well as after this program, down in the gift shop. So please go there to sign up as a member and purchase your books as well. So programs like these are so very important and you know made possible by the incredible dedication um, of our JCCH volunteers. And you know they're not only uh, researchers, but they are uh, interpretive guides and docents in our Okami Samate Gallery or Honolulu Uli Education Center and tours to Honolulu Uli, the, the site, um, which is uh, now under the National Park Service. And those volunteers I just want to recognize today are John Okutani and Marilyn Higashibe. Marilyn, where are you? And we uh, will be leading you through this program today. We also have Les Goto, Les back there, and Betsy Young. And Lloyd Nakamura, that's there. And of course, Jane Kurhar is not present today, but she's also had a lot to do with this program. So um, without further ado, John Okutani will be your MC today. Welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you, Audrey. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. This is how life works, because I'm from Makale, and we're doing this more project. <laughs> I think it's close enough. <laughs> but thank you for attending this uh, this talk story event on old Moili. Actually, it's Moili. Today we'll be talking about the surrounding area and the very ground that we're standing on from early Hawaiian history to the beginning of World War II. And as Audrey mentioned, uh, I'm John Okutani, one of two co-chairs of this event along with uh, Marilyn Higashide. She will be uh, facilitating the second part of the program. Of course, we're both volunteers here at the Japanese Culture Center. The program today consists of two parts. The presentation of the history of Moi and its early period by our special guest, Ms. Laura Ruby. And the second part, a Q&A slash talk story session with audience participation. Each part should be about 40 minutes long, and we're scheduled to end at 11.30. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our special guest today. Ms. Laura Ruby is a 2015 recipient of the Hawaii Living Treasure Honor for long-time community engagement, and a 2008 recipient of the Hawaii Individual Artist Fellowship, the highest state honor in the visual arts. She is a practicing artist and her prints and sculptures have been shown in international, national, and local exhibitions. Some of her artworks are her Nancy Drew series, 
about the art of art making and the art of detection, and her ongoing Diamond Head series about land and power in Hawaii. She also created large commission site-specific sculptures, among them Chinatown, Site of Passage, and the Battle of Mo'ili'ili. She taught art at the University of Hawaii from 1977 to 2011, and edited the book you see here, Mo'ili'ili, Mo The Life of a Community. She also co-authored with uh, Ross Stephenson the book Honolulu Town in 2012 and Honolulu Town in 2015. Uh, they're currently working on a project uh, in the, uh, it's called the Historic Honolulu Town Project. She's clearly an expert on the Moe'ili'ili community and its history and a well-known active supporter of local communities. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Laura Ruby. Hello everyone, I'm glad you could come today. This is my neighborhood, and for many of you, it is or has been your neighborhood for a long time, or you're very interested in finding out why this was once called Mo'ili'ili Town. It was a town separate from the larger Honolulu <coughs> city that we now call it. First of all, I'd like to, um, as, the, as was mentioned before, the book is available downstairs at the gift store. And I would like to thank, before we get, we won't see them in here, but I want to thank the people who passed on, our ancestors, uh, the old timers, who made this uh, talk story possible in a sense. They talked for about 10 years, but there was no book. And then came along um, people that, uh, that were really helpful, and that would be Colleen Kimura, Lila Gardner, Marilyn Mikashide, Arlene Sato, and Harriet uh, Natsuyama. The old timers, you might recognize the names Ralph Nakamura, Nakamura Brothers uh, Service Station, and Sojiro Takamura, his father was a tailor, uh, Charlie um, uh, um, Harada, who was instrumental. These people were instrumental in putting this all together, really. Sidney Kashiwabara, found the first family of, um, founding of Mo'ili'ili, or the Japanese American community. Charlie Kaluuya, longtime um, Boy Scout leader. And uh, Shizuko Mukaida, who was a longtime uh, supporter of the uh, Mo'ili'ili Community Center, of which I'm a member, and also uh, uh, Church of the Crossroads. So um, let me just begin. And so I won't get tied up in this. Let me, let me just show you. This is my t-shirt from one of our earlier Discover Moe'ili'ili um, uh, events that took place out at Old Stadium Park. And um, this is the blind fish. And when I'm asked, usually the questions that I get asked the most are, where are the blind fish? And what do we know about the caverns? So I'll get to that. And then at the question and answer period, we can always answer more. So we have, we have certain times that we can actually, uh, you know, people can comment, and I'm very happy to welcome your comments and your questions, and we can do it on and on. Okay, okay. okay this, is, this is the cover of the book, so if you're looking for it, uh, there's one copy over here, but there's plenty downstairs. Uh, and this, um, I want to thank also to the, the main artists that worked with me, to Jacqueline Moore Chun, who did this picture. She actually uh, looked out for her, from her condominium uh, apartment and uh, drew what, or painted what would have been there many, many years before. So it's uh, looking, looking manga, obviously. Uh, and the other uh, incredible uh, artist was Michelle Tamayose. She currently teaches at the um, um, Buddhist Academy. The, I'm not going to give the right title, I'm sorry, but over, over in um, uh, New Wano. Okay, now you may or may not be able to see the um, streets, but it is, these things are in the book, so you can see them much better um, at, at some point in the future. And this is just to tell you uh, that these are generally described as the boundaries. So we, well, when we first started out thinking about the book, we said, well, what are the boundaries? And so we asked questions. And even though some of them uh, said, well, this, the Alloway Canal is about 1926, may or may not have been there when they remember it. And the same with the uh, Manoa uh, Palolo Drainage Canal, also known as the Manoa Stream. Um, the, they were, uh, that was not dredged until uh, the middle of the 30s. 
So, the, but we agreed that these would be sort of the borders that are uh, for Mo'ili. Also, up right up in here, Dole Street was another perimeter because it was the uh, edge of the actual quarry property and the beginning of the UH property. And there were many, many, as we'll find out later on, there were many, many uh, uh, produce and flower farms that were there. And then here comes this other one, which is right over here. And the question we ask is, when you went to the um, Honolulu uh, Stadium, when you went to the old stadium park, or the Termai Palace, as many you remember calling it, uh, where, what neighborhood were you going to? And the answer is, Mo'ili. Now, those people that want to claim Macaulay as their home neighborhood, that's fine. Uh, and it does spill over a bit because people go back and forth between the neighborhoods. But basically, this is a kind of a soft edge that's over in this area over here. So just to let you know, those are the perimeters um, of, the, of the, and the, this, you can see this is County Y Field up here. This is the Alawai um, Park, Old Stadium Park, Mobile Ely Field. Those are the main um, um, parks that are in town. See, I've got things in my hands that I want to put away. Okay. Okay, the naming. How did, it, how did the name come about? What's the history of the name? Okay, today we call it Mo Ili Ili. Okay, Ili Ili, the pebbles, small rocks. I'm going to show you pictures. They were everywhere here, <coughs> completely everywhere. And we're doing it with the uh, diacritical marks, that is the uh, way that it's now come into fashion. I don't want to know, I shouldn't say fashion. It's kind of uh, following Mary Pakui. Um, this is a way to help people pronounce the words. Um, actually, in the Japanese American community, and maybe some of you remember, it's also called Moi Lili. Um, that, that's just a contraction, it, and, and basically the Hawaiians contracted names as well as the Japanese American community contract. And then before that, it was Mo Ili Ili, so the school was at one time Mo Ili Ili School, or Kao Mo Ili Ili was also Kao Mo Ili Ili School. And then these other three are probably the origins. How did the first peoples that came here decide to what to call it? You know. And what they decided is it was a section of land, another kind of section of land. And then Abraham P. E. Anaya, who was uh, really the founder of um, Hawaiian Studies at UH and uh, many other accomplishments in the Bishop Museum and so forth, and lived in the neighborhood. He called it Ka Moana Ili Ili, meaning a sea of stones, of small pebble stones. So we're, we're thinking things that are about baseball size. It could be very whatever. So that, that's the naming of it. So we keep this in mind, but we can know the rest of the history. Okay, the legends, they came much later. What people, first peoples, that, that's my hypothesis, first peoples named the places by what they saw. What was there, what was immediate. They didn't really name them for the legends. These are pan Pan-Pacific legends about the lizard and so forth. You can barely see the guy that's here. This is an introduced species all around Mo'ili'ili now. And then you might have heard of Hi'iaka and the Mo'u. Um, this is again, this is a, a, a legend that was transported probably across many islands and oceans and came to be told here in Mo'ili'ili as, but the interesting thing is there's really three different variations of the story, which indicates that it didn't really have a fixed place. Uh, it was uh, varied. And then here's the story that is from Mo'ili'ili and possibly other places also, the Mo'ovahini. And that is the story of the spirit figure that lived in Manoa Stream, or Waiaka Stream as it was also called, um, and under a rock or somewhere hidden in a cave or something, and came up and uh, maybe combed her hair, it could have been a male one also, and then uh, went back down into um, the watery um, world that she lived in. And um, some of the um, older Hawaiian um, people said that um, they never saw the Mo'owahine, but they, their parents and their aunties and uncles saw it. So we'll have to take that uh, as, as you wish. But it is one that is generated from this part of the island. And just to give you a big, broad sweep, this is looking from, if you were in Waikiki, you're looking uh, towards the, um, uh, towards Manoa. This is uh, Mo'ili'ili, Ili, the general area, all the way down in here, and Manoa's up further. And just a close-up to show you. And then one of the things, as I, as I was saying, the name,
name was shaped by what was there. And so the <coughs> geology is incredibly important. And while you can't see exactly, um, Mo'ili Ili is right in this area, right in here. And what you see are the karst, and that's the coral formations, and the Mo'ili Ili flow, which is, came down from Tantalus and flowed all the way down here. It changed the course of Manoa Stream, and it ends basically at the Mo'ili Ili Japanese Cemetery. So if you get an idea, the other ground is alluvium. That happens when there's big floods, and the floods drop a lot of the soil. This is, the, this is the quarry, and uh, how many of you remember calling it the quarry? Um, earlier people called it Ishiyama, from the Japanese American uh, language. And um, it was uh, dense, basaltic lava, and flowed. It was very important because it became, basically, all of our curb stones that you still see extant and around town, uh, parts of uh, Central Union Church and various other buildings all came from this quarry. So it was incredibly invaluable. And what it did is it provided loads of employment for people for its length of time from the late um, 19th century up into uh, the early 1950s. And this is this is on the uh, old um, Kamo Ili Ili Church site. Uh, you can just see the um, this back here, this is really rocks that were collected from the site and built on. And this is all um, Ili Ili that's here. So if, if you can imagine the Humane Society with all of this, if you can imagine the Kuhu School with all of this, and what is today the Contessa, all of this, and the Mo Ili Ili Japanese Cemetery, and instantly as one of the co-coordinators for the beautification, the Mo'i Ili Japanese Cemetery, which we've worked on for seven years. I'd invite you all to come over there and you can park inside whenever. And you can see loads of Ili Ili that we collected as much as possible. But you can also see the kinds of greenery and garden spots that we've made. And here's some uh, lava balls also. And what happens is the, um, the um, outburst from Tantalus, um, Pupukakea, um, blew out these balls, and they basically rolled down the hillside. They got caught up in the stream, floods, whatever, and they basically tra were transported down to the Mo'ili Ili area. And the Manoa Stream, just to show you, this is one of the areas that was, uh, almost all of the Manoa Stream is channelized. So, oh, faster. Okay, the um, view of the Kamo Ili Ili Pond, there's a lot of ponds. Um, and Mo'ili Ili knows a very watery source. And these are the ponds that are on top of the surface. They probably are sinkholes from the caverns underneath. So the quarry pond, how many of you have seen the quarry pond? Um, you know that that is still there and you can go on Sundays and have picnics there if you wish. It's on the university campus. And these will be too hard to see, but the book will show you better. These are all of the Ili's. People, when they were naming places at the time of the Mahali for the Land Commission Awards, they really did not name their Ahupua'a. The Ahupua'a we're in now is Waikiki. Okay? And it extends from sort of Makiki Street down to almost to Waikai. And it was and it went up into the valley, the valleys. So what they claimed is what they knew. And what they knew were the Elis. So the different colors you see are the different Elis, the smaller divisions. And the same is true here also, too. Um, right now, we're right, we're right about here. So you can see we're, we're built on top of a pond. Okay. <laughs> nice reassurance, I'm sure. <laughs> and this is what it was like in 1926. The, the uh, notion that if basically the low E, the, the pond fields, all stayed the same, except when the Chinese came in, they realized that their farming methods were far more efficient, and so they went from the mound uh, planting of kalo to the wide, extensive kalo, and what happened is then eventually they became rice fields. So, okay, the caverns. Are, where are they? They're everywhere. Um, and, and there also were caverns that are in the Eva Plain also. What happened is the sea level went up and down at various times and left coral deposits. This is over eons of time. And so the, um, what happened is when the Mo'ili Ili flow came in, the water came down, and these are called solution caverns because 
they are um, dissolved by the fresh water. So this is calcium carbonate, it's a very soft material, and they, um, uh, the water dissolves. So the, the caverns are not continuous, it's not like a, a real stream underneath us going all the way to the ocean. Um, if they're, they, stop, they stop and start, what happens is the water percolates through the karst. So you can see little bubbles. And I have to say, I did go down here once, but it was before I was warned that there's very bad air and water quality. So you can tell that I did not go down again. So, but I did see the bubbling water, and I did see a little catfish that was uh, swimming around my ankles. So, okay, so this is, these are just some of the pictures that are underneath. And this is one of the um, renderings that artists did based on um, man who saw them. Those are pillars that are driven down from the apartment buildings above all the way down in through the coral and down to presumably to some solid um, lava, which is the Kopolov formation, the oldest formation down below. And then you may have heard of uh, the sinkholes or the, uh, that occurred there. This is Kalo Lane, and it's a sinkhole, and um, there are people that lost their houses uh, because they fell in. Okay. And this is um, Kenji um, Miyashiro, and if you can see, there's water um, movement down here. And he's showing the, the sometimes the, uh, the caverns are maybe only three feet uh, high with the ceiling, the ceiling maybe only three feet uh, uh, thick and sometimes it's even thinner. And what happens is rumbling of um, trucks or other kinds of things just cause it eventually to collapse. So there'll be some other collapses around here and uh, you just want to go and look in and see what's there. Hope you're not around folks. And, and then people remember in 1952, this was the standard trading site, and this giant swimming pool fell in. And again, it's a sinkhole, but it really was a collapsed cavern down below. And the question is, how are the what about the blind fish? Are they really blind? There's two hypotheses, and I know which one is correct, and which one I favor, but one is genetics. The other one is environment. There's never been enough time here in Hawaii to have any kind of genetic change that takes place in terms of fish becoming blind. So the other one is the environment. It's probably in the water was probably the calcium carbonate which caused uh, irritation in their eyes. So the insects, the spiders, and the fish all um, had a, sort of a clouded cover over their eyes. And, one of the people that was very instrumental in helping with this part of the book, he um, bred fish, and so he knew what he was doing, and he said three generations later, the, um, the little cakeys were starting to see again. So it was just something that's a temporary condition. Big floods in Moiliili always. More. And then this, this is the, the uh, in terms of the Hawaiian, this is the Heiau, okay? It's not here anymore because ro ro uh, roadways needed rocks and those were convenient rocks. Unfortunately, that happened in the 19th century. And um, so they were basically gone and then along came the freeway and basically the freeway, as you loop around getting on from University Avenue or off, that's basically where it was. In other words, it was sort of a promontory and, and uh, Heiau, for its reasons, would be able to be um, uh, overlooking the rich, rich agricultural area. Moili Ili was really the breadbasket of the community and for much bigger. And you know, the um, Ili lived um, in Waikiki. So even though they had land holdings up here, they really were a part of it. And this is again, just you see the, another picture of where the quarry was. And then the Kamo Ili Ili church, I'm going to have to go fast because they're telling me I don't have too much time. But here, here is the uh, here is the church right here. It's a detail of it, and then this is the church. Um, I, I don't know how many of you might remember it, but 1968, it was torn down. This would not really happen today because we have greater uh, preservation rules and and people that are concerned about keeping things. It was really a church that was intact. It had four to six. Four to uh, two foot walls. It was solid, even though um, William um, Harrison Rice, the, the reverend, did not know anything about um, architecture or building.
building materials or anything. He still had, he and the Hawaiian uh, men helped build a solid church, with the exception of the roof, which blew off a few times. <laughs> and then this is it, at, as the, one of his, and his um, family members decided to put money into the church, and they built the front up again and put on a new tower. So you might have heard it called Rice Memorial Chapel. And this is where, when the, before the Contessa was going to be built, this is the collected burial of those people that they, and ancestors that they found in the cemetery. I might say at this time, the um, Hawaiian communities make, comes around, in, in the post-contact time, comes around the church, the school, and the cemetery. Those are always the three community pillars that are needed and, and welcomed in any community. The same is true with the Japanese American community. The three pillars were the uh, Hongenji, the school, which was the Japanese language school, which is now Mo'ili'ili Community Center, and the Mo'ili'ili Japanese Cemetery. So they're always, they're, there's always a, a nexus, always coming together of community institutions. Okay, the Kalo, this is the way the Chinese opened up the fields. You can see big fields of Kalo, and then um, when, when rice became um, viable here, uh, because there were tariffs put on the polished rice, um, they were growing more rice, and uh, that you might have heard City Mill and many of the other mills all derived from not only sawing lumber, but they also were um, milling the rice too, taking off the husk. Uh, duck ponds, many, many duck ponds, and they were actually judged by some people that trumped up things um, that it was uh, unhealthy. And so that was led to the dredging of the Alawai Canal. The quarry, um, major industry. Uh, for people that had skills, they were stone cutters. There were other people that hauled gravel to dray um, people uh, carrying um, wagons full of things down, mainly down to the, the harbor and to the roads, to build up the roads. And this is just another picture. And this is the dredger, as so it's dredging the Alawai Canal. I, it just, People, there's a, a nanny with a uh, baby carriage here. <laughs> and this is digging of the canal. And this is a, a, a new map that I got from um, Richard Nakagawa and um, June Hirai Matsumoto. And they, are, uh, they were collectively adding names to this particular community. So this is the um, Moili Japanese Cemetery, Kuhio School, and Mother Rice. All of those, and so they've added names and businesses and everything, and it's quite—I think it's quite complete. And so we were able to um, include that in our fourth printing of the book, which is what's downstairs. And then Moiliili Schools—it was called the Moiliili Mo Common School, and then just became the Moiliili School. You, how many of you remember Kohio School, 1922? <coughs> It was built and it was named. Uh, it really Abraham P. Benaya and his relatives, um, some of who were school teachers there, um, decided in honor of Prince Kohio that had been um, uh, helpful to their family, Kalakawa actually had been helpful to their family, um, that they would um, that they would name the school um, Kohio School. So it's been that way ever since. It was a, um, a really wonderful school. I wish again. Preservation would have caused it to be saved in the state. And this is the older school, part of the older school before the new um, uh, Kohio school was built, um, were in the, the basically plantation style buildings, the so, um, single wall, um, double hung windows, baton, roof, etc. Um, and the kids, and this was the lower school, um, <coughs> met for a long time in these um, small houses. And you can see that they had to take their plates with them to get the lunch, and then they went back to their classroom to eat their lunch. Cooking classes were held. Gardening was held. They were very resourceful people. You know, kids doing all these things. Uh, I guess a bazaar. I don't know what they were selling exactly. And then the, this would, uh, I felt this would be nice to trace because the actual addresses of the kids' uh, houses were there. They're all single family houses now, and of course we'd have something different this day and age. And then, just at World War II, uh, the um, air raid shelters had to be built. People had to practice going in there, which were terrible, musty um, things, places. And then, 
Mother Rice, that is um, a free kindergarten association. That was a really enlightened and had the, um, um, John Dewey and his progressive um, form of education. And it was learning by doing and um, flexing a more rigid type of teaching. So these are for the young kids. And these were all over um, Honolulu and elsewhere too, I believe. They gardened. And then the Mo'ili'ili Japanese school, this is only one part of the building here, but I'm going to show you more. This is the ditch. This is actually the Alanayo stream. It is an actual stream, and it has its uh, seat or its spring uh, at about Church of the Crossroads, where the end of the Mo'ili'ili flow is. And um, it was, when it was open, uh, the camps that were around there, camps mean some uh, person uh, got the lease on land and built houses. Maybe the camps uh, flooded out regularly and they caught fish on the sides of the, um, the stream. And then they channelized the stream in the ditch and today, and it, then it became covered. Today it's uh, concrete. But if you look up here, this is still standing. This is called the Sana Dance Studio now at the Moe community center. So this is it right here. And this is the women's um, athletics, if you can call it that. Uh, the bloomers, especially are awful. And um, this is part of the grounds. It's, and then the oh, group exercise before they would start their classes. And this is, I just picked one out. Uh, I think that's Judah. Yeah. And then, uh, how many of you heard of the girls' industrial school? This was for wayward girls, supposedly. It could have been any girl that was picked up after curfew or whatever. But it was up where the Humane Society is today. And they were really resourceful, too. They were, this is La Humble weaving, but they were taught regular weaving, sewing, crocheting, knitting. Um, they could <coughs> learn how to stuff their own mattresses. And part of it was, again, as with all of these schools, the common schools on forward, it was about socializing, keeping people, um, uh, aware of the niceties of interactions in social groups, and I hate to say it, but it was for working class employment. Um, in other words, there were no college classes. And um, with the Japanese school, the um, um, reason why it was initiated by Mr. Kashiwara, who was the founder of the Moe, the Japanese community, he was the first to arrive, leaving uh, the plantation in Kohala after three years, and and um, was able uh, to, to um, work uh, with people because he knew English, Japanese, and Hawaiian. So there are many, um, many more things. Oh, I got to tell you so much. Okay, the Hongachi, which is the first one. It was then moved, um, but the Yoshimuras were able to obtain property. And uh, the current location of it now is they, um, um, the one that's facing university, but previously it was facing the other way. This is a long dance, part of the outreach. This, this is the Higashi Hongaji. And then the Inari Shrine. The Inari Shrine is where the mice, uh, Macaulay Bicycle Shop is now. But it was moved by concerned preservationists to the uh, Waipapu Cultural Center, the uh, Hawaii um, uh, Plantation Village now. And so it is uh, back in its, it, it's, it's in a little group of other buildings, so go out and visit, and you can see it intact. And Church of the Crossroads, that was in the mid-30s. And it was, the, the, uh, it was really to bring the um, um, mid-pack students and other people from high schools together. They were all speaking English as their primary languages, and they didn't want to really go to the churches or temples that their parents were going to. So this was a coming together of a lot of ones. And this is the Moe Japanese Cemetery. This is was found on the site. We found a lot of things that might have been opium bottles and soda bottles and other kinds of things because Kuile was not cut through uh, as a street until the early 1950s. So this was one which is a mortar, probably maybe for herbs or something like that. Well, as time went on with the wine community, they didn't need heavy things like this. They could buy store-bought things. So that's how things changed. So you can, um, you can see this is during Obon time, and the title is right there. So we've done considerable unification there. And you can just see, this is the Mr. Kimura's monument. He was a very outstanding uh, he, a sake distributor, but he also, I just recently found out, he was instrumental in helping the, um, the Hompa Hongaji on um, Pali uh, to be um, secured, say, the, the land and everything else. So, and, and by the way, on, on our way to doing all of the um, things, we had lots and lots of help from community groups.
members, including this is, this is um, Kamoki High School, we had Iolani High School, we had the Marines, we had CPB, we had, oh, just count, I can't remember everybody that we had coming out there to help. This is Boy Scout Troop 2, and they are out there putting um, flowers for a memorial. And these are in the cemetery, these are, there's five Chizo figures, and they're for, they're for protecting um, children and young adults and mothers who passed away. There were a lot of uh, illnesses during the, the early time of the um, 1900s. This, the cemetery started in 1908, and um, before the days of antibiotics, frankly. And then these, this has a longer story, but because I'm short of time, these are two headstones that are Hawaiian headstones. Uh, they came originally from the um, Roman Catholic Cemetery on King Street. They were um, salvaged because they fell over, they broke. And uh, Mr. Olusubo, who was a stone carver in Mo'ili, uh, Harriet Natsuyama's uh, grandfather, uh, he uh, apparently obtained them, turned them face down, and used them as um, pavement for his very heavy stone carving and equipment. Now that's, they were desanctified, and it's a, it is a practice that happens elsewhere also. So this is uh, Kei Foikai, and which we have the history of, it. Uh, he was a jurist and a lawyer and everything. And the other is um, um, Ellen Kamakau, and she, although I haven't got the definitive words yet, but she was really a daughter that basically stayed at home, and she was the daughter of Samuel Kamakau, the historian. So these are pretty important ones. And so we, we've denied that they're in the cemetery. <laughs> and the Humane Society. <laughs> and then kids visiting the Humane Society. And then this, this again, you need to see a better form. But these are all the stores um, and businesses in 1939. They're both in English and Japanese. So that's very interesting to look at. Um, early businesses in the community, the blacksmith shop, and the Kumashiro store. Uh, cash and carry is different from the other mom and pops that um, uh, had a ledger and they kept your tab running for a month and then you paid off at the, at the end of the month. And another store. And then this is uh, the Nakamura Brothers. Uh, they had several different places, even these are the earlier ones, or still the later one, and you will know it now because it's the post office. And um, Takamura, the, a dressmaker, made many um, uniform, nurses' uniforms and things like that. And uh, uh, Mochimaki, this is uh, a celebration almost any time there's a temple or shrine or, or business opening. They always uh, had people on the top throwing the mochi down. And, um, and inside, sometimes inside were coins for people. So the kids, when, they, when people would saw the, see the announcements in the newspapers that said there's going to be a grand opening, they would all run down the streets and to try to catch the, uh, the, the mochi, and the, especially if they caught with, again, with uh, coins in. And this is the mocha oka um, mochi and uh, candies, and then became mochi, the mochi candies. Today it's the... Um, Cooney Island Fabrics. And this is the Yoshi, um, Maryland. I hope we'll say a few words about the fish store, but it also had manju and, and mochi. And the um, tofu store, uh, this is their, they really outfitted their tofu wagon and made it so it was racing tires. But, <laughs> but, um, but it's still, in principle, it's still the, uh, the tofu wagon. That was it, couple in the lane area, and King Street. Uh, flower stores in abundance because a lot of flowers, flower um, farmers up in the um, upper quarry, Joel Street area, and they bring them down, or they would go downtown. Um, and these are the flower um, and the um, truck farms that are uh, in the Dole area. So what you're seeing is the old, old Cookfield. Cookfield had three or four places for it settled in. And this is another one. You might locate it by, this is the, the um, University and Dole, but Dole's not cut through. And those are Founders Gates, that was, those were carved by um, Mr. Osubo, the stone carver. And then, uh, what, what did we, we, along the way people found things. One of my students found the mule shoe right by the uh, pool at uh, UH, that 
was, of course, the way that people went to and from the quarry because they were carrying the rocks or whatever in and out. The mules were uh, just like this, the drays. And then this is University Avenue going, looking through Dole, Dole Street down towards King Street. So that was, they had soapbox um, derby racing here too, and it was a little better refined. So University Avenue was built in, in strips, basically, um, many different strips. Transportation, uh, the electric buses. Uh, this is the corner of the Triangle Park. And looking, standard trading is right here. That's where they fell in. And the Shobu taxi was right in here. And um, other, other, other ones by that time. And the Kashiwabara family, the first family, as I mentioned, the founding family. And uh, this is the Kashiwabara camp, the Matsumoto camp. He was the um, um, first millionaire. And then on the other side, let's see, oh yeah, Dave Minamora's, uh, Dr. Minamora. Um, apparently very wealthy because there's a very large house that he had. Later he moved to Hilo. And then uh, here's what, where everybody else lived. And plantation style houses. Um, this is the um, Otsubo Natsuyama house. And this is the Ishida um, uh, compound, I guess I could call it that. Notice most everything was salvaged wood where you could get it from the docks or the cannery or somewhere. And this is of course Boy's Day. Uh, with all the flying um, koi. And so, again, the plantation style housing is single wall construction, double hung windows, and totan on the, on the roof. So that's the standard everywhere. Um, yeah, this is another another one. Yeah, that's Glenn Grant, who was the, um, the love tours. Whoops, Okay, the leisure time activities, the potlu riders. Um, somebody uh, just recently told me that they knew one of the women that were there. To have written it down. And this is the Mo'ili'ili field, not the um, stadium, but this was prior to it. This was the first um, place for sports. And, and you know, everybody was nuts about baseball <laughs> in this community, too. So, and Sumo, very grand, everything. And notice that they are skinny. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, <laughs> this is a, a more recent development, are they very large people? <laughs> And a baseball, very odd to be dressed up like that. <laughs> and this is out on Moe Field, both of those were. And these are pickup games. People that just love to play anywhere, anytime. The younger guys would get hints from the older guys on how to pitch and how to stand and so forth. This was a very important, this was a very important group of women. Uh, they were disbanded at the beginning of World War II because, because Actually, they were too good. That was, everybody wanted to watch them play, uh, but things being what they were, they were um, disbanded. And then, just to show you that the, all the uniforms had mobile on or something like that. The, uh, football games, you can see, you know, turkey game, all of that. And then the barefoot football, those are, that's at the stadium. And then the Boy Scouts and the Hawaiian um, basketball team. <laughs> And just some kids out in the back. I really like, you can't see it, but the cat, the cat's feet are way down here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is Harriet's brother. Uh, Harriet's father made the outrigger canoe. And you know, all of, the, all of the waterways were called duck ponds. So duck ponds made everything. This is the Houston ditch or the Alanai. And people fishing in the uh, canal, the, the uh, horses or whatever they were called and were there and everybody had their own. You certainly couldn't use anybody else's. And the Shibai, I just recently received this picture of um, one that's not in the book, but the other, this other one is, and the Shibais were, and later years were put on by the alumni of the um, Japanese language school. And the and there's the overview of Mo'ili'ili town now, part of city. And, and then I uh, just put this in just to show you what's coming. This is this is coming soon, the post World War II to present. So with that, I'll come back over here. And 
I know that they're done through various types. They're all done through the senior center at Mobile, the community center. But I would put my tape measure down and it would go down quite a distance. And what happens is the tree roots grow down in there, whatever, and there's um, various uh, pillars to uh, keep the, uh, the buildings upright. Let's put it that way. And this is happening now. There's a camp bugs the roots of the Yeah, it's causing the spot to have to be filled in. Right. It is the one that's sinkhole behind that building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, an, it's, probably, no, it's probably already there. And the, the tree is causing it. Once the tree disintegrates, you're going to have, somebody will have to make a decision. And, and, and by the way, there was a collapse over, also up in the athletic um, area. Uh, Patsy Manks, our uh, esteemed legislator, um, was um, one of the law school um, instructors. And they came to their building, their office space, it was one of the portables, and they found that half of it was collapsed into a cavern also. So, there's... <laughs> I just want to ask you um, about the Japanese um, tea house. What happened to it and who owned it? Okay, um, that's the um, Rainbow Shower Tea House, and it had the Japanese name prior to the war. And for a long time, the Asa family owned it, and it was a beautiful spot with the shower trees, and there was some other big tree that I remember seeing there, but I can't remember what type of tree it was. And it was quite <coughs> large, spacious rooms. Maybe some of you remember going there. I walked in as they were converting it to residences. So that's what it is now. I don't know who owns it now, but I, I think the gateway may still be there, but I haven't checked it out late, lately. It's on Calais Road. Um, in other words, you have to... Have to turn in right where you think you're going to the university at the athletics and make a little sharp turn and go in that way. Actually, there's a, a fence or a, a chain link uh, gate that stops you from going up to the dorms at UH. At once was open. There was, you know, and, and farmers were there too until they were, yeah, you know, told to go. Um, excuse me, but was it He's asking the question. The Contessa condominium was it originally a graveyard? Okay. At the the Kamo Ili Ili Church and the cemetery were adjacent. They're they're really together. And what um, happened is when the trustees and this is an interesting story when the trustees of Kauai Hau Church said to the Apana Church, which is Kamo Ili Ili Church, it was a branch church. Uh, they said, look, we're not going we're gonna to consolidate. We want you all to come downtown and go to the Kauai Hau Church. Well, that disappointed a lot of community members, you know, from all the different Apana churches. And so that closed up the church effectively in the mid-50s. Well, what happened is the 60s came along, and the trustees, the trustees are people who all have control of the um, buildings and the properties and everything. They... Um, um, decided that they were going to lease, I believe it's still in lease, but, I, but probably it's pretty simple now, um, that area, and there were no preservations, preservationists enough, they, were, they tried to stop, but they weren't able to stop, Nancy Bannock being the uh, premier uh, preservationist, um, they tried to stop tearing down the church. We know that there's so many other uses for that, it would have been you know, wedding chapels, meeting halls, uh, community groups meeting, and so forth, would have been great. But they had their way, and they were able to uh, get capitalized money, is basically it. So you look at Ilani School, they did the same thing. You just look at schools and uh, churches and temples, and when they sell off or lease off their land, they're trying to get money to build something more to capitalize their own activities. Yeah. I think. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I just would like to ask two questions one of which is a real question, and it is, would it be not tactful, but to ask how many people in this room live in Moeli Ili? Right now. Right now. How many live in Moeli Ili right now? Okay. How many live any time in their, in their past, including now? How many worked in Moeli Ili? very much. You know, it, it seems to me that I'm so glad I came to this meeting 
because I, I really had no image in my mind. Now, I've been here 50 years, so I've been here a while. But uh, I, I had no image at all of, of, of Moi being a, a lively community. But now I do have that image based upon these dozens of, of chunks of evidence that, that you showed. So I, I find this tremendously interesting. In contrast to that, to me, it, it, it seems rather dull now. <laughs> and in, in the sense that there's so many sort of mini high-rises and so forth, and houses crammed with many more units than they originally had and so forth. It just seems like a kind of a sleeping community to me. But uh, this has been tremendously interesting. I do work in, I have a, an office in Mogadishu over what used to be the Makale Chasui. Sure. <laughs> sure. I remember many days of the Makale Chasui. Yes. And then it was most recently included, and I don't know what it's going to be now. But it's, it's, that's vision for the state land. And, and there's going to be a whole lot more changes to their properties that they own in Bugs Alley and that uh, the varsity uh, parking area and so forth. So it's going to change and I don't know what it's going to look like. We'll get to know pretty soon, I imagine. But it was a time, an earlier time when you could walk into the stores and say hi to the mom and pops or the, 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 you know, their, their children, whatever. I know you have time, but forgive me because of how to show my ignorance, but could you talk about land ownership, how land ownership actually um, happened in Moyuri? Um, because
So most of the most of the houses that you can see, if you'll go back to the Lewis and Cook books of how to you know houses that you could build, the Lewis and Cook books were you know the low minimum that you could put into a house, and then higher money you could put in, and then up to really big houses. And so the Bingo Park track people had to put in a certain amount of money to build those houses. So they if they didn't go through Lewis and Cook, I'm Guessing they went to some other person that had the, the building the building books books on how to build the uh, the, the homes they were going to live in or sell. Okay, Limit. At this time, we're going to have Marilyn share uh, a memory from one of the uh, uh, book could not be here today. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for your really good question. Uh, transplanted mainland writer once said. People in Hawaii love to talk story, but what does it mean to talk story? It means to chat informally, shoot the breeze, rekindle <coughs> late times. It's what good friends do when they get together. It's a lovely way to bring people together and bring a place to life. So with that in mind, let's not waste a second because we can't wait to hear some of your memories of old Mo'ili'ili. We only ask that you try really hard to keep it to three minutes to enable as many people as possible to share. I'll start things off with some memories of Thomas Moriyasu, who is the youngest of nine children of the family who owned Mori Bakery and Cafe on King Street. Thomas really wanted to be here to share some of his memories, but was unable to, so he kindly wrote them down. So, and here's one of them. Growing up, I remember going to Japanese language school after Kuhio school. I would stop at the Moko, Motooka Mochi factory, which is in the present, where, where the present Le Flowers shop is located. We would eat the kakimochi in the back of the class and get caught when we ate too fast, and it made the crushing sound. We were supposed to let it get soft in our mouth before biting into it, so there was no sound. The sensei would come to the bakery and tell my mother. I always had to be on good behavior because the sensei always came after school to the bakery to pick up discounted pastries from my mother. My mother used the pastries to get the latest on me. <laughs> if I could just say one thing, um, Lila Gardner, who was part of our Mojave uh, History Project, she did way over 40 oral histories which are all combined in the book, too. So it's a major, major undertaking. And then Arlene Santo and Marilyn Higashide and, and uh, uh, Colleen Kimura and myself all did more targeted interviews. So there's a lot of stories that are out there, too. So. Oh, and now it's your turn. Please raise your hand um, if you'd like to share a memory or an anecdote. And one of the ladies will bring the mic to you. Thank you. I have some odd associations here, mainly through my family, but uh, I'm a retired from the Army Corps of Engineers, so I have an association with all the way that way, and I'm now leading a deputy director at the uh, Harbors Division. But it was through talking with, uh, where's Helen? Helen, about some, some past history on what the Corps of Engineers has done in the area that I came to know about this talk story event. Um, my memory of the area goes back to the early 1970s as I went to Mariano School and my grandmother lived on Koichi across the upset of my office. Uh, excuse me, house. But my, my family, my mom, my aunts, and my uncle, they have the memories that you were probably more interested in than uh, I can tell you. So I'm going to pass it on to them. We live across from that in Hawaii. And um, my younger sister still lives in court. We live, our original house is, was um, in back of the Japanese church on Gertania. Well, we live right in back. And the Japanese church bought the, our whole house and move our family to Koenshi, right across from Japanese Chamber of Commerce. And our family had um, Charlie Stafford, was my father and my uncle. And then they had 
when we reach out to somebody. And so our family is filled around this area. We're very familiar with this area. That's Les, Les Tom, correct? Yeah, he gave us some photos for the book, too. Very valuable. Uh, Sorry. How about some of the places you recall? Well, growing up in this area, I remember the old Japanese chamber, and there was a bubble house. I remember the old stadium where they used to have the, I guess it was a 50, well, state fair in the old stadium. And I remember Buck's Bakery. They used to love their sweet bread. They had a sign-in stand on the corner of uh, their family and it's in right on the corner. And it was like an open uh, sign-in stand. In the they had a little like a shack so it's where they would do the cooking and they would do the barbecue meat right outside. And living on Coney Street, we can always smell <laughs> nice aroma. And I think Simon was only like 10 cents. <laughs> That's how long it was. So, um, oh, excuse me. I was just, I had a question about the Simon stand. So, people ate out in the open. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And the food was cold. No, they had a cover. But then they had those morning benches. And they had like a this year between there was no room was wide open and it was always busy, especially during the football season. And they would always be a line there. Thank you. Thank you. I have a burning question to ask. What happened in Moji on December seventh? Because I know that the friendly fire attack you know the uh, Penn Street and McCulley, there are a whole bunch of Right, the Americans who perish. Yeah. But I'm curious to know what happened on December 7th in Boyd Lee. What was the impact well, of that? Well, first of all, there are things written in the book about it. Um, and, and a little bit of school also got hit by friendly fire, as did many other places. There was a, on um, uh, sort of um, Ka'aha and uh, Kahuna, there was a house that was bombed also. And various um, people in the interviewing that we did, they were out playing baseball already early in the morning. And they thought it was just practice. And they then realized it was a little more than practice. And they hurried home to Mohini to see how everybody was. So there was, um, uh, in the cemetery, there's a fisherman that lost, uh, 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 who was a haka there, a brave side, uh, who lost his life because he was out in a fishing boat. And the, uh, uh, that might have been Japanese um, strafing rather than friendly fire. <laughs> but friendly fire, everybody, obviously it was the soldiers were panicked and they were just shooting at something up in the air, forgetting that these bullets and missiles over there came down. And they uh, came down in Macaulay and Bogeyli, but I believe there are probably other places also. A lot of our food takes two weeks to get here from the West Coast before starting to kind of look into what was done during the war and maybe start developing plans for food shortage, food disruptions. Yeah, we, in the book also there's some um, pictures and some background information. Uh, Victory Gardens were everywhere, and um, what is now the uh, Kamoki High School was all completely Victory Gardens, uh, what you might call the Rose Gardens that were down on Pocky Avenue and all, that was Victory Gardens. People, um, I, I believe, was what maybe perhaps Arlene said that there were a lot of the um, flower farmers and all up in the Dole uh, Quarry areas, they had to switch to actual produce to make sure that, there, that we were going to have enough uh, uh, to eat here as much as possible. And that preparedness it should go on if um, we have more community gardens, uh, thanks to um, uh, Mayor Frank Fossey, who started a lot of the community gardens as well as the, the uh, farmers markets and so forth, that has been an awful lot to bring, uh, you know, local food to the attention of uh, people who live here. Um, but they, um, the, the farms were going full speed. There were also the date trees. 
And now there's only the sterile date trees, but there were date trees all around and people could eat those. My sister still lives in this neighborhood, but we live in places like... I, oh, close, closer. And we live in places like Wahiroa and Einheimer and Kailu, but we still think of Mohiliri as home. And when we see, when we meet people from the past, and they see Mohiliri, there's an instant con uh, connection. And, uh, but the face of Mo'ili'ili has changed so much. And we lived at the end of Holloway, uh, where the uh, university physical education plant is. The, the uh, picture with the decoy um, flags plant. That's their home. They see their home. Yep, they see it. And uh, our address was 1060D Holloway. I, I don't know who A, B, C, E. <laughs>
so forth. The, the telephone poles are still in the way of Covenant Lane. Um, that is needed to be done through city and county um, regulations. Um, that just have to be bringing them into some kind of conformity. Um, whether they ever get uh, sidewalks or not is a mystery. I know living years and years and years ago in Kapahulu, every time there's a big rain coming down from the hill, was a big flow of red dirt. And finally they put in some sidewalks there. So maybe somewhere in the future there might be something, but it's not so for it, so people don't and it costs a huge chunk to, of uh, property assessment to be able to put in sidewalks and so forth. Of Thomas Moriyasu. My wife was working as a custodian at the state courts on Alakea Street when one of the judges noticed my wife's last name on her name tag. He told my wife he remembered a little Moriyasu who was leashed to a pipe that protected the glass window of a Mori bakery and cafe. He said the little Moriyasu would walk up and down the sidewalk, greeting people walking past the bakery. My wife said yes, that was her husband, Thomas. Yes, the pipe and the leash, actually it was a dog leash, served as my babysitter as my entire family ran the Mori Bakery and Cafe. My mother told me that I wore out so many shoes walking back and forth. I grew up literally in the bakery walking in the front and napping in the kitchen when it was not busy in my mother's lap. I went to Mother Rice and then to Kuhio Elementary School. I was the last of nine siblings. My brothers and sisters used to say that I was a mistake because most of them were one or two years apart, but I was five years after the youngest sister. Just a question. It said coming soon. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's coming soon. Coming soon means starting with um, World War II, what we uh, uh, referred to briefly about the, uh, the friendly fire and bombing and what everybody did. Instantly people had to get ration cards, people had to get the gas, the, the, uh, gas masks and practice. Uh, people graduated from, from McKinley in high school and everything because the kids went to McKinley uh, with the gas masks over their shoulders in case there was a raid. Um, the, uh, the tree gardens that we talked about, all of those things, were more, and then many of you will remember Kuhil Grill started up after the war, the, the Willow started up after the war, there was a great boom in the GIs coming back and able to go to UH and expand out because many of the, the GIs, including Senator Inouye and all, had their education stopped basically because they were then um, in order to do the three varsity volunteers, which did um, uh, civil projects basically until the 442nd and the 100th were um, uh, given given to them. And remember, they are the most uh, uh, honored, dedicated uh, uh, units in World War II too. So, and there's a lot of things about the different sanctuaries. They more about the uh, uh, Church of the Crossroads and how it served its many purposes, always being a welcoming church. So that's just a brief. Uh, so this is a book. Yes, the book is downstairs in the um, gift stores. You do, I hope, and I'll be glad to sign anybody's book. Uh, no, this is all part of the book. So they broke the talk into two different events. So this, they asked me to stop at the beginning of World War II. That's right. Thank you to all of you for sharing your memories and for being a wonderful audience. We hope you've learned a lot about old Mo'ili Ili and encourage you to do your own talk stories with your families. Yeah, Lila has one more question. Hi, I'm Lila Gardner and I'm the oldest story Yeah, the first edition of the book five. Um, and we we interviewed more than 40 people for their oral histories, and 20 of them are at the University of Hawaii Hamilton Library, just so you know, you can look at them and learn more about Mo'ili Ili that way. But I would urge everyone here to be sure to write down. Talk story is good, but you have many family stories. <coughs> write them down for your family for the future. Writing is very good. And if you need any help with that, ask me. I'm happy to help. <laughs> Thank you, Lila. So please share your life stories and experiences with your children and grandchildren. They will thank you one day.
Again, どうもありがとうございます。